Oh my gosh, we have so we have so many people here. I know, I love it. I know, I do too. Um, okay, good morning, good morning. Good to see you all. For those of you that I can see, and then oh yeah, it looks like you can see most people. Um, all right, so let's just do a quick warm up. Um, I, it's not going to be a quick warm up though. I think I think I may. Uh, this feather is. It's a turkey feather, I believe, unless somebody else knows differently. I'm pretty sure it's a turkey feather. Um, but it might not. I think it could go fast, but it's going to be it will actually be a good warm up because feathers are kind of forgiving in the sense that um, they're not like faces. So if you make <laughs> the feather too long, it's OK. If you make the feather too short, it's OK. Um, and it'll give us some. Um, Stacy, can you see my when I do my little pointer? Can you guys see that? Yes. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. So yeah, this point, yeah, like so we'll get some textures along the right side, some textures along the left side. It's amazing how drastically different the left side is from the right side or the top side from the bottom side. Um, I mean, they're similar, but you know, they look like it looks like two different feathers came together and they they glued one side to another. Like they're not as cohesive, but they'll have similarities. Um, okay, <clears throat> and then I do want to do the um, I do want to do the Mona Lisa eye. So I think we're gonna I think the main lesson today is gonna be like human eyes, and we're gonna do probably just we'll, we'll have to see. I kind of want to do one eye thoroughly just so we can go over all the component parts, and then maybe we can expand on it when there's more time. Does that sound good? I mean, who doesn't want to know how to draw the human eye? And I and <clears throat> you can draw them forever and they never get boring, which is also kind of interesting. It's like the eternal subject matter that you know just keeps getting more interesting the more more times you do it. Um all right, I'm going. I'm ready to go. Hold on, there's a chat. Let me see what I can see in the chat. I'm really bad at reading chats <clears throat> because um oh thanks guys. I'm supposed yeah. to be. Uh, yes well no i mean well you can do it stacy's good at that i just think the um the screen my image takes up so much like the the feather is taking up so much room i've then, got it so the rest of aww. the faces take up the other one you have <clears> a wonderful happy birthday from simone and naomi <laughs> says good to everyone thanks naomi it's all good Thanks, Stace. No, I got, I got it now. If there's a new one, let me know. <clears throat> um, okay, so let's fire this thing up. Um, I'm going to start with the. Um, I wish I knew the names of these things too, like the, uh, the, like there's like the quill part. We'll call it the quill part. You know, at this very bottom corner where it would enter, where like this feather would enter into the body, like enter into the skin. <clears throat> if you've ever plucked a bird, I mean, they go in like pretty deep, actually, in kind of a gross way <clears throat> um so i'm going to start with my little triangle here this is where it would turn into a pen and you could turn it into a you know a mark making device Woo! okay so there's this point and then i it's weird early on it, get, it gets to be the widest point and then it's gonna get progressively thinner and thinner and thinner until it turns into like just the thinnest line ever so I'm gonna do left side, right side, left side, right side. <clears throat> In my mind, I'm doing left side, right side. And I'm gonna make a little feather that's a little bit smaller than this one because I don't think there's any other way for it to fit on the screen. <clears throat> so I'll be, con um, what's the word? Con I'll be making it smaller. What word am I thinking of? <clears throat> um, this is also, it's also, um, like a, it's kind of like gray and like clear at the base. And then about at this point, it goes, you know, very dark. And if there's any light, it's just reflecting off of the shininess. It's actually a dark object. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna shy away from shading it in right now, but um, we'll get there. Okay, so let's look at the bottom. The, the nice thing about the bottom is that it looks like it's a, the pattern Ooh, yeah, it, it changes. Let's just get the swelling. I don't know if you guys can see this, but you can estimate that like it looks like these um, the little 
the little, like the feather vein parts, um, they seem to cluster in like these swellings. So I'm just gonna estimate it. I'm gonna use this swell. This one almost turns over itself. Um, it looks like it starts narrow, of course, and then there's the body of it. And Oops, then, excuse me. That's okay. Let's get rid of that. Is that the, is that the owl from last week? Mm -hmm. And then I again, I have to I have to pull it in a little early. And I can't tell where the. I think the vein ends a little bit early and then it turns into these like spirals out from here. Okay, the top part is I think a little bit more exciting um, in that these at least have clustered for some reason. Maybe it could have been damage. It could have been damage to the feather or it could be the nature of the feather. They separate into these, almost like these long triangles. Whoa, cool. And I have never drawn this feather. There we go. Um, it spaces out. Um, it's tight close to the close to the center. Mm -hmm. And that's where these like, yeah, I think it is actually the nature of the feather because these um, black bars. And I will have to figure out what those actually look like. So interesting. I know they really are. Um, so we're in the phase where we're kind of like just establishing what is the physical parameters of the feather, meaning what is the width, what is the length, um, maybe a little bit of like texture somewhat, but um, not even really. Just I'm just trying to get like how wide it is, how long it is, and establish the limits. So then I can start toning. I mean, so much of it is going to be tone and texture. So let me pull this back in. So about a third of it does not separate. <clears throat> and without really becoming intimate with the, these feathers, you know, on the bird, you know, there's probably feathers that are a little bit smaller than this, a little bit bigger than this, um, without knowing even what kind of bird it is, what, you know, how long this feather has been, you know, out. I mean, it, it went through like a manufacturing process. Like I, I bought them, you know, I bought these feathers from like the craft store. Um, so who knows what happened to it between the bird and when I got it. So it's hard to say what is the, what's nature and then what is just happenstance. And I'm referring mostly to like how the, there's like a color change and how it, it starts to separate. And I'm actually, honestly, I'm leaning toward the fact that there may have been a little bit of damage um, to this feather, but I still like, I still like that it gives me you know, this, the, ed, this edge here, you know, the, like the, the, this, the spaced jagged nature of it. I find it beautiful. I found it actually very feather like, um, and it happens, you know, very aggressively actually, um, down towards the bottom, you know, where it, it basically thins out into, I'm just going to call them the hairs. I'll call them the hairs of the feather. I know it's not hair, but you know, the hairs are kind of erratic at the base, which is kind of a signature of a feather. And then they become highly organized. I mean, you know, like, like salt, like, um, you know, like the most militant soldiers you could ever imagine. I mean, they're just each one of these, I mean, actually I'm going to hold it down and like, so you can see how if I, I separate it, they are just, okay. they okay. can separate, but they, they, they weave together like perfectly. Um, so these lines that I'm putting here are, you can't even see them. I shouldn't even put them on there. The way that the um, the way that these feathers grow, I think the component parts to the feather. You have the center triangle, and then you have these little veins that run this way and this way. Now that being said, these veins actually have patterns that go counter to it. So the even though the 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 nature of the spires, the hairs of the the feather grow like this. Um, the patterns do not conform to that. So the, the patterns go this way. So I'm looking at these, these like beautiful little columns of black, these black bars. Those black bars um, 
I, I don't understand. I can't, it's amazing. It's almost like a way. It's almost like a rug. Like if you had a rug, you would weave it this way and weave it this way. But then how the the designer makes the pattern, you can make any pattern you want within that weave. And that's sort of what's happening here. You can see how they're split like this. Where they're split is how they go the whole way. So I don't know if you can wrap your head around that. I mean, hopefully you guys have looked at feathers in the past and you probably know the terms and I probably should have prepared it before anyway, but. Um, <clears throat> really we have two feathers in one. Um, so now we have the parameters you can, and, and the way that these, the hairs are growing were really necessary for the edge at the top. And you might even say that it's necessary for the edge at the bottom, but now I'm gonna like focus not on those, the way that it's growing, but actually the way the pattern is attached to those growth. So it's, I'm not thinking of the weave of the rug, I'm thinking of the pattern that's on uh, the rug. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's only 14 um, big bars at the top, which I think you don't need to do every single number, but I find it, I find it when you, if you were to copy, let's just do one bar here. You know, if you just like, yeah, I don't know. I'm just gonna try and, I'm just gonna try and observe and see, estimate the, how thick the black bar is versus how far apart they are. Excuse me, Trevor. Yes, Dace. Did you have a question? Uh, no, I just wanted to let you know that the base or the, the thickest part of that stem is either called the quill oh, or the great. calamus. Yeah, let's just call um, it the quill. Right. The other word for that is calamus. Okay. Also, uh, on the very bottom, the part that looks very soft or the yeah. softest, uh, there you go. That's called the uh, plumulaceous barbs. The plumes. That's why they, right. that, must be, that must be where plumage comes from. Um, yes, indeed. So these are some of the other feathers. These are some of the other feathers. Um, and these, hold on, let me breathe on it. <laughs> Part that's moving, that's probably the plumage. Those are really yes. soft. And then they, yes. and out of that grow the rest of them. Yes. That's nice. That's real nice. Um, I have been noticing that these, the bars on the top, um, many of them, they almost feel like tree trunks in the sense that there's like, almost like there's like a little root system. Like they get wide as they attach to the quill. That's interesting. <clears throat> and I'm, and they, they don't seem to have um, an exactly consistent geometry. You know, I'm, I'm keep, I keep drawing new ones and yeah, they, they like get narrow at the base, they widen out a little bit and then they, and then they get smaller. I don't know, maybe narrow, wide, narrow. I guess that might be the closest thing to a consistent nature. <clears throat> so I'm placing my bars and I'm going, I can kind of like go one to one. Um, but you can ask your, you know, you can ask yourself, okay, so well, if I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and do 14, one. Yeah, so I guess I got, I got, I have 14. If you have 12, it's fine. If, you know, whatever. Your feather is just, we're using the feather as a, um, an excuse for mark making codes. So, um, uh, yes. Is there a question or comment? No, I actually don't. Okay. Did you finish? <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Um, I am going to work faster then. Um, <laughs> Let's take a peek, Ellie. Oh, okay. 
Nice. Cool. Very okay. nice. Yeah, it is really nice. So well um, Ellie, one of the things you can work on too is if you look at the, the, if you squint your eyes, the whole feather is dark. Like the entire thing um, is a dark object. Are there lights and darks within that object? Yes, there are. So when I'm making a these bars, you can maybe even blend the you know, tone. I should not blend, but yeah, tone the feather so that there's a you know a mid tone for the space between the bars, and then dark tone for the bars. Would you say the top part of the feather is um, lighter than the bottom? I would. I, w I think it is lighter, um, but what I think it is mostly, it's a higher <laughs> intensity color. So it's a bright orange where um, the patterns on the lower bar um, are um, more neutral, meaning they're like gray or, or like a kind of a nondescript brown. Um, so in the spirit of working faster, um, I did, I am looking at the, let's see, there's, So there's like 16 of the smaller ones, um, thinner ones at the bottom. And then they're a little bit more interesting in the sense that there's a solid bar, there's a solid color towards the quill. And then there's like a, a, like a spotty patchwork towards the outside. Um, and then in the, in, the, in the idea of like the, the actual shape of the bar itself, I'm seeing an S curve. So I'm seeing an S curve and then the top is like a little bit erratic. So I'm mm -hmm. S curving the bar, <clears throat> making the top a little erratic, S curving. The ball. S curving. Okay. And then yeah. you've got this black, you know, this, this tonal situation in between these two where they're mid-tones and then very speckled towards the bottom edge. And then I'm also looking at this too. These bars are, are as dark as the top bars, but underneath of them, there's like a light halo. Uh, all right, so I can, I think I'm in a position where I can you know, shade in my quill because the quill is also one of the darkest notes of the whole picture so that we know that the bands can be as dark as the quill. Um, but more importantly, the space between the bands need to be a little bit lighter. And I just, I, I have been using these long S-curving um, these long S-curving marks for the bands in the lower half, which I think I may be overdoing a little bit because when you get to the top, they almost turn into bands like the other side. Oh. <laughs> All right, so I, what I'm really gonna try to do here in the next, you know, eight minutes or so i'm going to try and tie this thing together meaning i want to unify it so i have i've represented at least a staggered you know a, a, there's a disjointedness the disconnect from the bands at the bottom to the bands at the top which i like you know it's not like it's a ladder it's not like there's the left side and the right side match up although it looks like i have kind of matched them up i didn't mean to do that hmm. trevor yeah yeah on the, the far outside right of that feather, does it look like stippling to you? Or may, I'm not sure what the word I should be using. Like the spots? Yes, yes. Yeah, I know. Perhaps I, the word is spots. I mean, I see them <laughs> the, I see them not as stippling. Stippling, I, almost, I see them as random. I feel like these marks are almost in rows. You know, they're, okay. they're not, they're not bands, but they might be formed the same way the bands are in that, you know, if the dark band makes an S curve from the inside mm -hmm. all the outside, 
the spots might link up too. I see. But remember, you know how Stacy, when I talk about stippling, I think about you know making dots and spirals, and then hitting, you know, I, then hitting the open areas. No, I had forgotten that until you just said it. So thank you. Well, no, well, that's the thing. When you make stipples, is like when you're kind of uniformly putting dots in an area equally. So there's not actually a pattern. Whereas mm -hmm. in, this, in this case, I think it's okay to actually have the dots be lined up in rows. I see. Just a side note. Side note is a wise note. So it turns out that, you know, uh, I have been putting in, I'm using these, I'm using my classic, you know, Bic number two pencil that, uh, you know, I just got from just like the, I don't think, I think I got these ones actually at Staples, but, you know, I didn't go to the art store to get these pencils and um, they wind up blend, they blend really nicely, but they also lay up, they actually, when you, when you use them, it's a soft pencil and it does lay a lot of pigment down. So I'm, it's like, I, I just by doing the drawing itself, there's actually kind of a lot of material on the paper, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, so I'm trying to, I, I'm blending and I'm able to blend. If you're using a harder pencil, like an H or a two H, God forbid, mm. if you're using a two H, um, it just wouldn't blend as, as much because it's not as soft of a material. Um, and you know, it, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just the look of the drawing will be a little bit different. And I think that, you know, I know that it's a, overall, it's a very dark, this, this particular feather is very dark. So um, by having more pigment down, it doesn't work against me. I'm kind of lucky in that way. Whereas, you know, if I was drawing this shell, you know, the shell, which is like so light and airy, if I tried to make that drawing, I draw a, drew a dark silhouette, you know, there'd be like way more pigment down than would be necessary to draw an object that is lighter. Now, I mean, just look at the contrast between, you know, how light and how dark the shell is compared to how dark um, the feather is. I believe I'm done, Mr. Trevor. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll do a, um, we'll do, we got, we got four minutes until 11. So a half hour warm up is like usually the way I like to do it. So give me four minutes. We'll give everybody four minutes and we'll have a little show Good. whether you're ready or not. Um, and if you didn't finish, you know, if you haven't finished or whatever, like who cares? Uh, I was working. I could. I could have spent. I could have spent an hour or more on this. Now I blended that out so I can pull in with my eraser. Oh, that looks so good. So the other thing that I really enjoy about these big pencils is that, and I say it every week, but the 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 pencil eraser is really calibrated for this exact material that is the pencil. You know, the, the, the pencil graphite that goes down, they've calibrated the eraser and you can get, you, know, you can get really quality erasers that are compatible too, but yeah. So I just pulled, <clears throat> erased, made these little gaps in here to help with that, the look of the feathering. Now, because I blended, you know, because I blended um, all of my pigment to get kind of a darker object, I, I will I need to come back in and reapply some pigment so I can get that pop and get that dark contrast between. And I can also get the uniformity. So I like these bands, how they get split up here. That's not like that. Cut this band in half. <clears throat> it just has a nice naturalism. 
<clears throat> I also like the um, I didn't I didn't sketch it, but maybe I'll do it up here. There's um, the wing tip. You know, the bottom half seems to overlap the top half, which you know I'm further I'm far enough along in the drawing where I cannot I cannot panic as much. I can start thinking about some of those interesting details, like some finishing details. So here's my lower my lower feather tip is going to be overlapped. Always overlapping the the top of the feather of the is that is it showing? I think it's showing. Just there. I think that's I think that's just like kind of a handsome detail. And your everybody's interpretation, <clears throat> you know, and if you, whatever your codes were. Um, I'm also looking at the bottom. It seems like it goes smooth, then jagged, then smooth, then jagged, then smooth. And then there's like a little overlapping up here. I'm all about that. And I, I, I kind of like that there's a darker silhouette. I haven't thought about any shadows. It's not really many shadows showing. This is a little bit down in this corner. But this piece really isn't about light and shade per se. I, for me, when I started this, it's more about the pattern and you know the contrast between the upstairs and downstairs of the feather. And yeah, it's just um it's fun to explore. And that's a weird thing about Michaels is that they have so many like horrible contrived like marketing, you know, like little <clears throat> craft things that are so tacky and then we also have like a, a, a feather section that's just like oh my goodness they, they, you can buy these feathers for like four bucks a whole huge bag of them and it's like the most beautiful thing you've seen <clears throat> all right cool 11 o'clock on the dot <clears throat> let's do a review look how subtle that sh oh, man, that shell looks so good there sorry i can't help that <clears throat> nice. That is a pretty show. I haven't drawn that show either. All right. Let me stop the share. We can um, we can go down the line, and then we'll tackle the Mona Lisa. No big deal. No big deal. It's just it's just one of the the most recognizable paintings of all time. Um, all right, Ellie, I think you're up. You finished first. Let me pin you though. All uh, right, sure. And then I've got Eden next. Eden, Renee. Oh my gosh, yes. Nice checkerboard. Okay, Thank brilliant. You. Phenomenal. It's not bad. That's, a, that's not. That's not. That's a. That's a well spent half an hour. I'll have to admit. All right, Eden. I'm replacing the pin with you. Place pan. You want to hold it up? I'm not really done. No, I mean I I'm finding thing. it difficult. Oh wow. Yeah. It's yeah, interesting. But you have a really nice mark making, and there's a really nice bounce. Even like right now, the darkness of the center quill versus the midtone above, and then it's a little bit lighter below. Regardless of the observation, the drawing itself has a really nice uh, balance. You know, between uh, dark midtone and light, yeah, and interesting mark making, cool. All right, is that? Thank you. Do you have any questions? All right, Jackson, you want to do yours? Ooh, you went totally horizontal. That looks great. Yeah, really good contrast between upstairs and downstairs. Um, don't feel compelled to do this, but the center quill. It might be a nice, elegant, uh, dark note that would go, it would like pull your eye all the way across. So just, just, a, just a thought. Um, let's see who's next. I think it's Simone. Yes. 
Replace pan. Nice colors. Well observed. Yeah, that feels like a that feels like a feather to me. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um Madeline. That's it. Replace the pan. Oh, it's a whole page of them. Yes. Those are great. What a great what a great sketchbook page. Yeah. And sometimes, yeah, and I also am a huge proponent of just drawing from observation. And when um, so whenever you can, um, that's where the source, the source of all creativity comes from that. Um, so it's a, even though it's through this medium, um, studying great artists is really helpful, um, but so is drawing from observation. So anytime you guys can do that, even if you're just like sitting, waiting for like a car, just like sketch the rocks at your feet. Okay, um, Sebastian, you're next. Man, those are so nice. What did you use for the dark one? Are those, did you use pen or colored pencil? Uh, for the colored one, I used pastels and the other one I used pen. Yeah, wow, groovy, dude. Yeah, thank you, excellent. Uh, Amelia. Okay, I'm not finished. I wanted to take different colors and like shade like into the center. Yes. Wow, that is inspiration. That is dynamite. Whoa, cool. Yes. I don't know. I, I love it. It's you got you gotta follow your bliss. That's where it's at. Um, all right, how's Dara? Can we see yours? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yes, also very good contrast between upstairs and downstairs. Mine was almost too close together. And that sits in the page really nicely. Well observed. Thank you. Uh, Naomi, you want to do yours? Such a big class. Dag. Looks like you can pick that thing up off the ground or off the paper. Yep, all right, great, we did it. We did it. Um, who else is next? Uh, Janaya, and then Noah, and Tegwin. The Art Nook. Yes. Cool. It looks really good. The, um, the, qu the, the quill looked like it went a little bit lighter, about three quarters of the way up. And I don't know, and, I, and I'm looking at it now, it kind of does that. It felt like it was really thick in the middle though, I don't know. Um, but um, a beautiful page nonetheless. Uh, Noah, can we see yours? Yeah, you were using that lighter pencil. A little higher, a little higher. All right, cool. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, and feathers are also really delicate. You know, they're really light and um, they're by nature, like, like really light objects. So when you have a light line and you draw light objects with light lines, there's like something very compatible about it. You know, it feels very, it feels like, like organic. Um, that painting of your shoulder, not the pride. Do, do you know who the artist is? Um, you talking about that in the background? Yeah, that's a poster for Lord of the Rings. Cool. It's not. Yeah, painted. that's awesome. It reminds me of my friend. This is my friend Sarah. One of her paintings. All right, sorry. Yeah. All right, Tegwin, can we see yours? Cool. Yeah, all these feathers, we could we could like make a whole bird. We could put a whole turkey together. I love it. Yeah, and actually the um, the heavier line on the bottom makes it feel like that's the underside. So it almost, even though we didn't, I didn't push like the light and dark element, the, the light um, softer lines above and the heavier lines contours below um, give a suggestion of light and it feels very three-dimensional for that way. So 
Cool. Good work. All right. Did I get everybody? Did we do Rowan's? Do we do Rowan's? Are you no. there? Let's see no, it. No, we haven't. Okay, yeah, let's see it. If you don't mind. Can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think so. Who is it? Identify yourself. If that's Rowan, I can hear you. The um light the light here is it is here. Mm -hmm. I'm still not seeing it, but I I'll give you a second. Oh, interesting. He left. What's up? Rowan left. I think oh. he's well, I didn't know who was then. Was it him that was talking or no? Stacy, can we see yours? Good God. Stacy, can we see yours? I pinned you. You're on mute. No wonder I kept saying the same thing over and over. You're muted. <laughs> but I didn't know I was muted. Um, before I show Ellie and Sebastian, I didn't get pictures of yours. So may I see one of your, each of yours? Ellie, go right ahead. Thank you very much. And Sebastian, I'm sometimes just not as quick as you all. Thank you, well done. And uh, you know, I was listening to um, the lesson so yeah. intently that I didn't draw it. Oh, well, that's that's fine. You don't have to draw anything. Wait, um, can I re show mine? I think I finished it like fully. Yes. Yeah, of oh, course. Let me move this. All right, Jackson. Let me come up. Oh, and that's lovely. Yes. It's like a yeah. feather inside of a feather. Yeah. The conception. Mm -hmm. Like a That's feather all. inside yes. of a feather inside of a feather. <laughs> is what I say. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Inside of a inside of a piece of paper, inside of a room, inside of inside a house. Of a house. <laughs> inside of a town. <laughs> inside of a city. Inside of a state. All right, we can just keep going. That, that is a that is a, a, a like a anyway. I don't have to get into that. All right, I love. I do like thinking about expanding. World. Uh, Trevor. Yeah. May I see yours again? Oh yeah, perfect timing. <laughs> and if you could move your. Ah, uh, uh, thank you. That's lovely. Okay. Wow. Should I do it this way? I guess we will do it this way. <clears throat> um. Yeah. All right, party people. Let's get our um. Let's get our art faces on. I oh, can't... Mona Lisa's eye. Yes. Yeah. No. It's 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 coming. It's coming. Well, if anyone has not done any form of anatomy with Mr. Twist, uh, I mean, he's really, really incredible in all different uh, walks it. of art. They see love comes that. To anatomy, uh, his people come from far and wide for you his anatomy. You can't trust Stacy. She's too biased. She likes it too much. Well, <laughs> I'm just kidding. No. Thank you. No, 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 no. I appreciate the credibility. Um, okay, so what I'm using, what we're going to use um, to do Mona Lisa's eyes is, um, God, I can't believe she doesn't have eyebrows. It's just so funny. 
It's so funny that she doesn't have the eyebrows. Um, okay, so um, I don't want you to be, I don't want you to be intimidated. It's actually like, Da Vinci is like so classical. Um, and when people say classical, I mean like he was kind of like by the book. Now, there's obviously exceptions to that, but I like teaching him because he um, he was really more of like a scientist. Like he approached things with like a very scientific mind um, rather than like a you know, emotional and expressive mind. And so a lot of the distortions, a lot of the variations that occur, the things that you can't like kind of wrap your head around until you get to like really high levels happen on like looser, um, you know, looser pictures. So as far as like learning how to begin and think about um, how to paint or draw a person, Da Vinci is like the guy to go to. Um, I was considering um, starting with some of his drawings and I'm like, you know what? Um, because we did so much, you know, blending. Yes, you, this is there a question? Yeah, what time period was he an artist? So he was like Renaissance. So he was basically like, I think, basically like the 1400s. I think he was probably like 1430, lived a little bit longer than Michelangelo. I think he made it, maybe it made it into the 1500s. Um, it's so interesting because I, I've like, I've like studied Da Vinci for so long, but I, I don't know if those are the exact dates. Whoa, my gosh. All right, what? So I just, one of, this book has, this book is an old book and it's in black and white. And I've said that you, you guys will hear me say this a million times, but like sometimes older books, the reproductions of drawings are actually better. And then a lot of times the sculptures are better because in order to like make a sculpture translate well from, um, you know, in, you know, through photography or through printmaking, it has to be lit right and it has to be photographed well. Um, and strangely enough, we have like better printmaking materials and better photography materials today, but the people that are taking the pictures don't really know how to light it to bring out all of the most beautiful aspects, um, the way that people were trained in like the late 19th, early 20th century. So sometimes the books that are in black and white, especially when they're sculpture, um, look better. Um, because they're because they're lit properly and they're photographed by almost an artist themselves, not um, not like a technician. Um, anyway, I saw that um, there's this reproduction, uh, a full color reproduction of Leonardo da Vinci's eyes in a self portrait, and I Ooh. think it might make an interesting contrast um, to you know Mona Lisa's eyes. Now this is a black and white photo, um, and it's it's good um, because we're drawing in black and white and we have graphite. So um, I will show, we will do the color version um, of this eye. I think it's this eye, yeah. It's, we'll do a color version of the right side eye. Um, I think we'll have time to do that or at least we'll like analyze it and it's got more details. Um, this is actually a really good reproduction um, for our purposes. And I'm gonna, we're gonna use what I call construction lines and construction lines are lines that um, don't survive the final drawing, but they're necessary for us to know what's going on in the picture. And um, the, the best example um, of construction line that we're gonna need to use is the, the expression of this lower eyelid. So there's a point where the lower, where the eyelid touches the eyeball and it's right here. So it's right along this moment. Now, I, in a painting, you can change colors. So you can have the flesh tone of the eyelid and you can have the, you know, the color of the eyeball, which is actually a little bit cooler. It's like a bluer color where the flesh tone is a warmer color. So but in black and white image, you don't have any color to help separate. So the, the, the value, meaning how light or how dark, the upper lid and the eyeball are the same value. So we're going to need a line to separate what is eyeball from eyelid. But in the end, we're probably going to erase it or lighten it up. Does that make sense? So when we draw these eyes, so there's going to be a bunch of lines that I'm using to technically express, to explain what we're seeing. And then that line is either going to have to get diffused out or, um, or completely erased um, in the end. But like I said, the, the elements of this picture um, are basically universal. So you're looking for the, the elements that we're gonna go over, you're gonna look for those same elements 
on every eye and every face and every head, every human um, being that's existed um, in the past and in the future. Um, meaning in the future, meaning like when you draw people's portraits from life, um, we'll be still looking for all of these same things. And when it comes down to it, there's not that many. So when we draw them today, think about what we're doing is like almost a visual checklist of the things that you need to, to start drawing um, you know, somebody's face, somebody's eyes. And you know, there's people, people, there's people that, you know, I've done this method before and they're like, don't you need to like place the features on the face, like draw an oval first and draw the center line and the brow and like place the eyes and the nose and the mouth. And then the chin and come up the jawline into the ear. Like you need to place those things first, cheekbone, fleshy part of the cheek, you know. And I'm like, yes, that's helpful to like get the placement. But today you, you, you have to, um, it's good to just get the anchor of the face, which is the space between the eyes. So we're going to do the space between the eyes. Then we're going to do the eyes. And then I promise we will discuss like portraiture and how to do the rest of the structure of the head. We're just gonna like zoom in, hone in on this one thing, um, which is, you know, the eyes. And it's, like I said, this is as classical as it gets. And if you follow me step-by-step, step, it's not hard. It's not even like, you don't even have to invent anything. We're just, or really even, I mean, trust me, I think, honestly, I think the, the feather is probably gonna be more challenging than what we're about to go over. So don't try to make, if it doesn't look like the Mona Lisa exactly, that's okay. Um, we're making a check, we're using the Mona Lisa as a checklist of things that we need to know in order to draw eyes. All right, so that being said, let's start this thing. Hmm. Make sure you have your tortillion, because the tortillion is gonna be important. Um, and then make sure that you have a, a pencil and a positive attitude. <laughs> I'm just kidding, you, can, you don't need a positive attitude. But Trevor? Yes, Ace. Did I hear you say color at one point? Oh yeah, I have Is another that... version. I have another version that's in color. Oh, um, oh that's I, what this you were is, saying. This, I think this is so much. Got this it. I I I misunderstood. That's okay. Um, I'm just noticing. Look at how look at how you can see like um, the inside of the eye sockets here. That's called the keystone. So it's like this, is like where the unibrow would be. You know, if she had eyebrows, she doesn't. She doesn't have two eyebrows to unify into one eyebrow. She just has no eyebrows. But if there were eyebrows, this would be the front of the keystone and there's the inside of the eye socket. Mm -hmm. This like shape is called the keystone, but I'm looking at like how that runs into the nose. It's like starts off, it's just so interesting how it goes. Like the, the line is suggested, but it's so soft how it goes into the nose. Here. I've never actually noticed that. Look at like, oh, look at the area in here, it's like so soft and diffused. Anyway, sorry. Like, I'm just mean like the eyes are so dark, the underneath of the nose is so dark, the mouth is so dark, but like the area from nose, eyes to nose is like very quiet, very subtle. Mr. Um, very distinct too. Yes. Yeah. Um, I misplaced my, is it called a tartillion? The little shading stick? Would mm -hmm. I be able to yeah. do it without it to make it look yeah, you, right? you can You can do this without it. Um, one of the things that I will do if I don't have one, is you take a piece of paper and you fold it, and you fold it, and then you fold it, and you fold it, and you just keep folding it until it gets to be like this, like hard, like the hard end, like that. It's amazing. Like paper is so flimsy, and you keep folding it, and it becomes really stiff. And then that stiff, stiff edge, I'll you just use that, and it it blends it out. The whole point is that, and that's all a tortillion is. A, tor a tortillon or a tortillion or blending stump is just a piece of tightly rolled paper that they've happened to sharpen, but you can fold it and get almost like as sharp of a tip. Um, you just, when you blend with your <clears throat> finger, you get your oils into the, into the paper and it can like kind of negatively impact it. But you know, if, if this would, this would be a, a poor man's tortillion, it's just a folded piece of paper. So <clears throat> I, I, I've done that a million times. Could I use Q-tip instead? Yeah, I think a Q-tip would be good. Um, yeah, you can, and you can roll the Q-tip tighter too, because like it's almost like too fluffy at the end. Um, but if you stick it in your shirt and roll it tight, then it'll become a, a good instrument. Um, just don't do it with your finger because then you get your oils on your finger and that's the whole point of using, 
you know, just to not get the oil in there. Oh, look, she's, she's this is, is, she's, there's a, a tear. I, I, the, I put this, the cursor right where it's about to go. <clears throat> All right. Um, so first things first, um, this is called the um, keystone. So the keystone is a, it's almost like the top of a column. And it's, you know, sometimes it's curvy, sometimes it's really <laughs> straight. Um, in, the, in Mona Lisa, it's, it's curvy. And it leads up into the eyebrow. Don't sketch it yet. Like we're gonna go, we're gonna, um, we're gonna bring the eyebrow back into this keystone. She's got this beautiful S curve above for her eyebrow. And if I zoom out, you can actually see it better. You see this like beautiful S curve. There's an mm -hmm. S curve that's gonna, there's an S curve that's gonna come back into the keystone here, but we don't wanna get there yet. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the, I'm using these lines for the front of the keystone. This is the unibrow area. And then, and then I'm using lines to show that there's a little bit of shadow on the side of the keystone. Now, there is almost an implied horizontal here. You see this line is at the base of the keystone where like mm -hmm. kind of the nose begins. You know, there's this rounded portion of the nose right up there. And that's the, um, it's like, you know, the, we call it the bridge of the nose where like the bone turns into cartilage. We're not going there, but you have to know that the keystone leads up into the forehead. It goes back into the brows. It goes into the, the, the um, tear ducts and it goes down into the nose. So I would even take your tortillion and maybe s attempt to soften that line just because we know you can look at it. I mean, you look at it and see that it's soft. So I used a hard line, but I, I'm like kind of trying to set up, set us up for like really soft lines. We can erase this line later or should I thicken it? Um, you can, yeah, you can, I would, I would go, if you can, I mean, all my lines are probably a little bit heavier than they need to be because of the screen. So if you can make these lines that I'm making, just make them lighter, um, you'll, you'll probably thank yourself later. Um, all right. So this form here, I'm going to, I have to do this sidebar thing and you'll actually thank me for this too. So if you have um, columns, so you're a dude, not a dude, but you're a person, and you're standing uh, on the ground now, and you want to build a, you know, a house with a roof. You know, these are columns. So columns, you, know, you can take stones, you can stack them, take stones and stack them. Now. To cantilever, to get the coverage from uh, one side to the other, if you cut a solid piece of stone, it becomes like really brittle and it's not particularly stable and it's not even that elegant. Um, you could make a, a, a wooden roof, which is like plenty of you know, architectural elements that have made a wooden roof. Where I'm going with this is that this guy can carve stones that are, oh no, that was off screen. This guy can carve stones that are um, shorter on one end and taller on the other. <clears throat> and then shorter on the inside, taller on the other. And where I'm going with this is that you can build an arc, taller, shorter, longer on the outside, shorter on the inside. And you basically are taking a whole series of these trapezoidal stones and you're planting them on top so that you can build an arch. Um, it's, it's classic architecture. Um, this is basically what is going on with the eyebrow ridge. So when I think about the eyebrow ridge, I'm thinking about a, a similar type of stone the keystone is the one that's in the middle. This keystone keeps all of the weight 
pushed to the side and in the columns so that it doesn't fall on top of the dude inside the inside the house, whatever, or the building. Um, so let me shade this in. So this keystone is narrow at the bottom, wider at the top. And because it's a stone, it's gonna have three dimensions. Front, inside. Now, humans are organic, so they're a little bit curvier. So that's where we get the kind of the curve of the bone of the eye socket. There's a long-winded explanation, but I think it's important to know. That's what this trapezoidal form is. Okay, next phase. Um, the inside of the keystone um, is bone. And then what that does is it establishes, and I'm, I'm putting this line in here, but um, if you put this line in, make it very, very light. This is the cavity. This is the eye socket. It's a, it's a cavity where it's a hole in your skull where the eyeball lives. So the first indication of this eyeball is the start of the tear duct. Now, this is really important that you have to see that the edge of the keystone here is the edge of the bone. And then the eye, the, the tear duct of the eye, there's a little gap of skin. And you can actually see the highlight. There's like a little bit of skin that is that bridges the gap between the edge of the eye socket and the tear duct. So in this case, the Mona Lisa has got this beautiful um, curving oval. You know, sometimes tear ducts are triangular. Sometimes tear ducts are uh, square. Um, in this case, she has like a, it's like a hairpin turn. And the hairpin is probably the most accurate because the hairpin has a um, upper portion of the eyelid and then it turns the corner and it goes into the lower portion of the eyelid. So let's do that right now. Let's do the upper eyelid where it's in contact with the eyeball. And we'll do a lower eyelid where it's in contact with the eyeball. So there's this like slit. And of course the upper eyelid, the, the eyelids close and they make contact with each other. The upper eyelid is the only one that moves. The lower eyelid is a stable, and then the, the upper eyelid functions like a windshield wiper. It goes down, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up. Now, the eyeball, the eyelid itself is skin and it has no structure by itself, but it is thick. So um, the reason that this upper eyelid on Mona Lisa curls is because that skin is wrapping and pressing itself up against the eyeball. The eyeball itself um, is, is actually solid like i you can like you know i guess in halloween you can put your they do they like peeled grapes like feel like eyeballs or something like that like there is a density to the eyeball where if you can feel your skin it's like really um loose and has no structure in itself it's almost like more fabric um so we have to get the curving nature of the eyelid based on the roundness of the eyeball so as i lay in this arc um, the eyelid touches the eyeball at this point, and then we have to show that that eyelid has a thickness. <clears throat> the lower eyelid comes across, and then that has a thickness as well. Now, if you go into the bathroom and look at the, you know, look at the corner of your eye, the upper eyelid and the lower eyelid, they do meet. There's, a, there's like a, there's a crease where they connect. Typically, um, the way that the growth happens, and I think it has to do with like a, your, your eyelid being like a little bit of an awning. Um, the upper eyelid comes on top of the lower eyelid, typically speaking. So I would do a little bit of tone on this upper eyelid because it faces the ground. Next factor, 
the next reason the upper eyelid is darker than the lower eyelid, and actually you can see it in Mona Lisa. I mean, her upper eyelid is very dark. The thickness, the lower eyelid has this similar thickness. It's just way lighter. Um, and Da Vinci doesn't, I wouldn't say unfortunately, it's like sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. Um, there's eyelashes that are above and they also contribute to the, the seeming darkness of the upper eyelid. The upper eyelid is skin, it's in shadow, so it's dark, but the illusion of its darkness is implied um, by the hairs that grow out of it. So I'm gonna also darken. And you can actually see how he gives us this dark note um, above here and above that other side. Amazingly dark rainbow um, on, that, on this upper eyelid portion. And in the same way that it's amazingly dark, um, the lower eyelid is actually amazingly light. <laughs> cool. Um, so there's two things that happen um, when you get to this stage. You kind of have to go in this order. Now, the next thing is like, do you draw the iris and the pupil inside the eye? Do you draw the fold? Like when your eye is open, it folds under itself. So there's an upper, there's a, this fold of the upper eyelid here underneath the eye socket. So you can put that in. And then you also have the iris and the pupil. So the iris is round and then the pupil is in the middle of that. And you have to kind of like figure out, and this is so faint. I'm gonna try and zoom in a little bit more. Yeah, it's um, really hard. Very, very, it's very dark. So you have to almost, in certain lighting situations, you have to know what you're looking for other and that's why it's like good sometimes to start with drawings because he like it's spelled out so clearly um in the drawing because you're you know it looks it looks like this um you have the pupil you have the highlight and then you have the iris and i like to draw the iris with these radiating lines you know the the iris is the part that expands and contracts based on lighting you know if it's a dark room the pupil gets really large if it's you're outside and the sun's bright the pupil um, gets really small um, and it's the part that's green or blue or brown um, depending on your eye color the darkest part of the eye is always the pupil because the pupil isn't an actual physical object it's an empty room and the you're looking through you know the cornea you're looking through the lens you're looking through this keyhole um, into the back of the eyeball. And the back of the eyeball has the receptors um, that re interpret the light, send messages to your brain, and you're able to like see. That's how you know, it works. It's a short, <laughs> short version. Um, but that hole in the eye that opens and closes in terms of regulating light, you're not, it's not an actual object. It's, it's, it's light disappearing into a room like a you know, like a keyhole, like looking at a keyhole into um, another space. Nice. Um, okay, cool. Now, this is where we get into the, what I would consider the fun part. Um, there's this structure of the eyebrow. Let me zoom out a little bit. Um, we're going to get to the structure of the eyebrow and then we're going to wrap back into um, the keystone. And we will have kind of represented all of the things that need shading. It's, it was like the beginning of the, the feather where I drew the center, I did the top and the bottom, and then it was just a matter of toning. Um, we'll go from the fold. And if you, if you, you know, if you close your eyes, this fold disappears because the, the upper eyelid has extended itself and it's covering the entire surface of the eyeball. You open your eyes up, your eye retracts and you know, the, the fold of that, of that skin overlaps. The skin overlaps into a fold. And we're gonna move away from hmm. um, the curve of the eyeball. So this fold is created kind of by a sandwich between the eyeball, which is at the bottom of the fold, believe it or not, and then the structure of the brow ridge, which is bone. So right now we've talked about the um, eye socket, the inside of the eye socket on the left. Um, this fold kind of represents the top um, of the, the, uh, the top beam of the eye socket. And then the side beam of the eye socket 
is this brow ridge. Um, and I call it the sausage because it looks like a, um, you know, a breakfast sausage. It rolls up this way and it re-enters back into the keystone. And this is where we get this um, beautiful suggestion of a, um, an S-curve. And we, are gonna, we can shade the bottom of it. Um, I don't want to get too heavy into shading, but you know you can't not see that the bottom of the the bottom of the eyebrow ridge is darker, and it gets darker um, underneath as it hits the eyeball and goes into the keystone. <clears throat> and when I say seamless, it it does have a seamless transition, except there is a seam at the eyelid. <clears throat> Um, the eyelid reminds me is like a bridge. I'm just gonna do that. Hopefully this makes sense to you. Um, I'm looking at the eyelid, the upper eyelid, and there's the thickness. And then this is the walking bridge. So this is land, this is land on this side. This is land on this side. You know, we'll call this water. Um, you know, you can put the railings on the bridge, railings on the bridge, and then you have this sun that's on the left side. So if you can imagine the sun's up above and to the left, so the side of the bridge is dark. And then the left side is going to be light, so I'm going to put an L right here, that's light. And as you come up over the bridge, you walk to the other side, as the bridge turns away, it starts to go in shadow. So that's the structure, the lighting of this 3D object that is the upper eyelid. So you have the darkness on the, the side of the bridge, and we have shade on the right side. And just to remind you, this is where the pupil and the iris would be. Okay, so there's our eye bridge. I can actually keep this in here. It's not too distracting. Um, so when I'm shading the bottom of the, the um, sausage, you have to take into account that you're also shading the right side of the upper eyelid. Um, without too much effort, if you know that the right side of the eyelid up top is in shadow, then the right side of the eyelid on the bottom is in shadow as well. So we'll pull this away. I'm gonna shade the right side of this lower eyelid. The thing that I love about the lower eyelid is I always think about it like a basket. Um, it's like, it, it like holds the bottom of the ball of the eye um, in place. And there's something like, it's almost like you can almost imagine like a, a cup, like the, a cupped hand, you know, holding it, holding it in there. And it makes a really beautiful um, curve and it actually defines kind of the, the lid itself is defined by the roundness of the eyeball. And the sphere is such a beautiful shape. Uh, Mr. Trevor? Yeah. How did you draw the bottom of the eye? I mean, the bottom eyelid. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, that, I, I would say that it was probably the hardest part in the sense that you have to kind of um, almost um, imagine where the eyelid touches the um, eyeball. So this was like kind of the imaginary line that I put in there. So it goes from tear duct and it rides along the edge. And then I added the thickness to it. And that, and this is almost like a train track. I'm actually gonna sacrifice a couple of these lines. So I, I put like this little flat plane of that lower eyelid. And that lower eyelid, if anybody's like stubbed their toe or like is like about to cry and they're like, eyes are starting to water. And you're like, I'm not gonna cry. I'm not gonna cry. If I blink, I'm gonna cry. If you just like, if, if like that, where that water is accumulating is on this ledge of this lower lip. And that's why you don't wanna close your eyes because then it squeezes the water out and then you start crying and then it's, then it's over. But if you can keep it, your eye open, you can keep yourself from crying. Not that you should, I'm just saying. That lower lid is where the water can accumulate. And that's why it's called the water mark. 
Um, so the lower eyelid, I actually echoed sort of the direction. You, you got to imagine the eyeball inside of this area. And so I just used this line, you know, used the concept of the bottom of the eyeball to define that lower eyelid. And it's the bottom of the ball, so then it goes into shadow. <clears throat> um, this S curve, you know, as you see the, the rounded bottom of the sausage, and then you get this like kind of like uh, it's a soft, it, it's kind of a soft edge at first, you know, it's kind of like a soft S curve, and then it comes up and it like really aggressively turns back into the keystone. And we're go we're basically going off of what Da Vinci gave us, which is an eyebrowless woman. And the way that that the way that the eyebrows would go, and it's almost helpful in the sense that um, a lot of people confuse the eyebrow ridge, like the bone of the brow and the bone of the sausage and the bone of the the eye socket. You confuse that with the hair that grows on it. So like you can get hit in the head of the dodgeball and it's not going to hit your, I mean, I can hit my eye like this and it hits my cheek and my forehead before it hits my eyeball. It's a helmet. Your skull is a helmet basically to protect your, basically to protect your eyes. Um, so knowing this underlying structure that um, Da Vinci gives us, you know that first and then you see how the hair grows on top of that, grows out of it. And you know, there's marks at the top and then there's marks below. And you can actually just analyze it, like go around and, you know, no one knows, like look at their eyebrows. And, you know, sometimes people have really, um, you know, more hair above and then smaller rows below. I think that's usually how it goes. I think there's, the eyebrows usually grow like this, thicker above, and then there's a smaller one that's below the ridge. And you know, it's a filter. The eyebrows are above our eyes because of gravity. There's dust and debris that come from up above. Our hair is our main filter. Then the second filter is the eyebrows. Then the third filter are the eyelashes. And then if that's not good enough and particles still get in our eye, then we have a flushing system of the tear duct, which just waters and it, and it, and it washes out all of those particles that are, um, that got stuck in their eyes. So the brow ridge, you know, it, the, the bone protects you from impact. Your hair protects you from particles. It's kind of interesting. Okay. Um, and the tone, you can just like kind of follow the tone. The light's coming from up above. Inside of the socket is shaded. The underside of the eyelid is shaded. The underside of the fold and the brow ridge are shaded. The far side of the eyelid is shaded. The underside of the eyelid is shaded. And then um, this, the, this girl probably looks a little intense, you know, the way that I drew the eyes. Um, the eyelid throws a shadow onto the eyeball. And then the ball itself turns away, just like the bridge, just like the, um, the eyelid. As the eyelid turns away from the light source, it goes into shadow. The eyeball does the same thing. So you're looking at the sclera, which is the white of the eye. The white of the eye on the left is really bright. Now, the, the, uh, the white of the eye on the left is not bright because it's in shadow. It's turned away from the light source. So even though it's a light object, um, it's still going to be dark because it's in shadow. <clears throat> and this is where I'm eliminating my train tracks. And I can even eliminate the edge of that line, replace it with some tone. Oh, I love what you did for the shadow that is created from the lower lid onto the eyelid. I mean, onto the eyeball. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. 
yeah, now my eye has some, you know, has some pop. And I could give it even a darker line, but I, I, you know, I'm not trying, to, I'm really not trying to copy what Lynch, I mean, I'm trying to copy what Lynch is doing, but not really. I'm trying to just explain that he was thinking in these exact same terms. So you can't, you can't draw something unless you know what to look for. Like you can't, like, it's not, it's, it's just not possible. You have to, I mean, you can draw something because it's lighter or darker, like, you know, or you might have learned how to do um, the basics, but, you know, th this is, this is a more of a scientific approach. Like everything needs to be named in order for it to get this level of um, accuracy. I'm also gonna soften the transition between the eyeball. I, I actually put this in, I didn't even verbalize it, but the tear duct is like a gland that you're seeing and it's like mostly covered by the eyelid. Um, and then that gland is usually pink or red or something like that. And then, then that turns into the, the sclera, which is the white of the eye. So with Da Vinci, he barely, barely separates the two. He just, he just tones the, um, the gland of the tear duct a little bit. Um, and then lucky for you all, um, the way that you can practice, you know, the, the, the way that you can like, show that you know these things is to find them on the other side. Um, and this might mean, you may just have to, we only have like 10 minutes left, but the first part of the drawing takes so much longer because you're in, it's being introduced for the very first time. The second part um, is usually so much faster. So um, you can try and keep up, mostly, mostly you can, but um, I can also send the video if I'm going too fast, but we got 10 minutes and I really want to like finish the other eye. So all of the things that we just went over on the right side of the eye, we are going to have on the left side of the eye. Um, and it's just going to look a little bit different. So if we start with the side of the keystone, it exists. It's a, instead of being this thick side, it's this thin side. And then we get a little bit of skin bridge. And I'll show that little bridge where the eye socket ends before the tear duct begins. There's a little light patch. And then on this side of the tear duct, the little oval almost feels like a triangle. Um, Mona is looking directly out at the viewer, but her head is turned. So if you look at the sclera of the eye on the right side that we already did, it's a huge sclera here small sclera on the right um, that it's going to be you know a, a different view so you get a tear duct and then the thinnest sclera you can imagine and you get the pupil and the iris i'm just placing those in really quickly because i want to be able to estimate my upper eyelid it goes up across the eyeball and back down the lower eyelid comes across and then up into the corner. So this is our quote watermark. You know, this is where the lower eyelid touches the eyeball. This is what this is what the this is what the upper I built that little shape. I'm adding thickness to the upper eyelid. I'm adding thickness to the lower eyelid using a line, knowing that I'm gonna have to erase it. Lower eyelid coming in front, side of the iris, circle of the pupil, other side of the iris. Um, one of the nice things about when you, if you ever look at an eyeball that's not, um, you know, if you just look at an academic eyeball, you know, in an art book or even in a medical journal, you get a sense of the size of the eyeball versus the size of the iris and the size of the circle of the pupil. So all three of these circles are relative to one another. Now, the sclera is cropped so much by these eyelids um, that it's hard to imagine what the size of the eyeball is underneath the eyelids but you but 
you should look at it. You should Google it, find it, and like draw the eyeball um, separate from any other characteristics. Just so you get a sense of what is going on underneath the eyelid and underneath um, the structure of the eyebrow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't look like he's got any highlight in this, in the, in the other side, interesting. So there's this pupil. There's a little bit of the shading of the upper eyebrow, of the upper eyelid. I'm going to put in my radiating lines of the iris, and then address the other parts. So we got upper eyelid, and that turns into the side of the boat. Oh, sorry, I forgot the um, the fold. So you have this upper eyelid that touches the eyeball, and we have the fold, which is echoing the same shape. So it goes up, across, and down. The fold goes up, angles across, and then tucks back down in. And that fold is what gives us the beginning of the brow ridge, this hairless eyebrow ridge. So you have the side of the sausage, the eyebrow comes up, and then it angles down, back down into the keystone again. So elegant. Um, the dominating eye, I mean, the size of the eye in the right versus the size of the eye in the left, um, you know, is notable. And in your, in your piece is adjustable, um, meaning this stage, um, we don't know whether there's tone or not. Um, you know, we don't know whether, I don't know whether I'm correct with the size of the eye unless I start adding the tone. So you gotta be a little forgiving um, when you're in this stage because you just really don't know. Okay, we got the sausage. And then interestingly, we do, we are able to see the side of the head because of the foreshortening, the corner of the eye versus the, the profile of the face. Um, it's because of the head is tilted, it's so much closer. And I think it's important to, to show that. The last element that I think we need um, is the little basket of this lower eyelid. And where the outside was shaded on the first eye, now the inside of the basket is shaded for this eye only because the light is coming from the left. So everything on the left side is gonna be light, everything on the right side is gonna be shaded. And as I laid in those marks um, for the placement, now I can do the tone. Inside of the eye socket, iris, pupil, upper eyelids, really dark. Inside of the keystone, underside of the eyelid, amazing. Um, yeah, so the fold is dark, um, but because the eyelid, you know, angles up, the eyelid is really light. And so you get the crease and then that crease almost diffuses into the underside of the brow ridge, you know, that, that, that bone brow ridge. Yeah, so like the eye, the, the eyebrow functions almost like a visor. I mean, it comes out further um, than the eyes. The other thing, uh, Trevor, that you uh, did that I really forget is, mm. for instance, I'll use the line around the iris. It's not a single line. You break it up or you vary the line weight. Yeah, interesting. So um, I, I think I know what you're saying, but one of the things that I, that what I, di I didn't mention is that you have the inside of the iris here, but the bottom of the eye is cropped by the eyelid. So that circle is, is not completed. So that, that is an interesting, you know, I know that sometimes you can do, you can bury your line in the silhouette, um, but here that line is broken because the eyelid comes across.
I don't want to, but I have to. I have to erase this eyebrow line. But I needed it. I mean, I needed it so much. I guess I can still use it to put in the eyebrows. We'll give Mona some eyebrows. And if you overdo it, she'll look like Billy Eilish. All right, so I just went off on that. Is there any questions? I'm I'm losing some of my some of my line lines. Um, I needed a line to self separate the lower eyelid from the sclera, and here I just softened that a little bit. It's amazing um, how dark um, certain pigments can go. Meaning, um, paint. Um, paint and pen and charcoal can go so dark and become so black, like, um, you know, night sky. Um, and graphite is just a gray, <laughs> you know what I mean? No matter how dark I make um, this graphite, the darkest it will ever go is, you know, just so much lighter than, um, the intensity of a of a charcoal. So fortunately, I, we didn't get to draw the other eye. But I will show it to you. Um, this is the version that's in color. And then maybe we can do a little show and tell. And it'll probably make you feel better um, about the graphite. I wonder if we should have yep, we should have drawn this one to begin with. That's as high as I can go. Yeah, you know, it's as that's as close as I can get to it and maintain stability. But wow, look how um Look at how much narrower the values are. The book, the book that we were using went so much darker. Hmm. And it's larger. So the color barely helps. I mean, I'm looking yeah. at this lower. I'm looking at this lower eyelid, and the only reason you know it's a lower eyelid um, is because it continues on over on this side. I mean, they don't call. I mean, fine art. Um, you know, you it basically achieve like higher degrees of subtlety, and you know, Mona Lisa is you know subtle on like to such a degree. And I'm looking at the um, this little nick right here. I'm wondering if in the photograph that I put, see my little highlight that I put in the eye? I wonder if that highlight is even, a, is like a reflection mm -hmm. from the photograph or even yeah. a, a distortion from the printer rather than a um, natural highlight. This is not in this one. Back in a flash, Trevor. Okay. I tried to draw the nose because it looks kind of weird without nose. Uh, it does. Like this. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, 
What did Mona Lisa's nose actually look like? Because I kind of forgot. There. I don't think her mouth is that small, though. I just had to fit it onto the page. If that doesn't make you smile, I don't know what does. Okay. I'll make Mona Lisa smile. Isn't that the thing that everybody thinks she's smiling? That's one way to stop the share. <clears throat> Can you guys see the thing? Okay, let me just show you. The, I'll, I'll show you the Mona Lisa one more time, and then we'll, I'll stop it so we can have a quick review. Um, hopefully, this was not too much. I tried to. Um, yeah, it is like a masterpiece. So. I thought it was quite intense in a good way. Yeah, no, it was definitely intense. <clears throat> is is her face up there yet? Yeah. Oh, you can see it. All right, then I must. I'm going in the wrong place. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay, cool. yeah, it's just tilted. Kind of. Okay, um, I there she is, and you can find super high resolution images of her online. That's like the nice thing about doing like kind of unbelievably popular pieces. They've they've made them accessible um, on the internet. So there's a lot of things that are problematic with the internet, but um, you know access to high resolution images of masterpieces, uh, pretty good. Okay, let me stop the share. So. Um, Ellie, you want to go first? Uh, sure, but the nose looks awful. Well, I mean, we didn't really go over the nose. Yeah, cool. Those are great. Okay, Jackie, you're next. I'm just gonna look at them real quick. Like I said, it's a checklist. It's not necessarily, uh, wow, rock and roll. Nice nose too. It's actually a nice transition. I, it will be lighter. It will, the tone will be lighter. You know, and then you just erase it a little bit. Um, Janiyah, can we see yours? Who right. did you ask for? I didn't hear you, Trevor. No. Um, I couldn't get to the second eye, but I started it. Oh, it's gorgeous. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. I, I really oh, like the, um, the shading under the eye. Simone, you're up. Nice white chalk nice. pencil. Is. Yeah, isn't it so beautiful, the transition from the, the sclera to the lower eyelid? It's like that level of subtlety is just like dynamite. Cool, thank you. Nice and big. All right, Madeline, I think you're up next. There she is. Yeah, there like she somebody. is. I know. Sebastian. Cool. Okay, so mm. the only thing you need is like on the far side, it's a it's a shorter distance from the corner of the eye to the silhouette. Um, it makes it now it's like yours is like perfectly balanced, so it's almost like the person's looking right at us. But very good, good tone, Amelia. Can we see your eyes? So I didn't do the nose. Yeah, no one didn't. I mean, I didn't do the nose. Yes, I didn't do the nose. Uh, Amelia, I, I don't contrast. see you. Hold on. I love the I love oh, the tear ducks. Here we go. Oh, and I love the uh, the lines in the um, retina. Oh, the, the, the iris? 
Um, like I said, yeah. the lines and, then, and the iris. Oh, the toes. I like that there's no blending too. I mean, that's like, it's really aggressive. Um, Eden, can we see yours? Blended one eye, <laughs> but there it is. Yeah, I mean, one perfect eye is better than- Yeah, that's lovely. Two non-perfect eyes. I love it. Great, great job. Um, Dara. Yes. Yeah, you got those. Layers. Got those layers. Yep, and you've got yeah. this, this, the, the, the ratio of the sclera really well. You mean like left side, right side, both sides are like perfect. I mean, a person looks like they could start blinking. Um, Jackson, did we get to see yours? We did. Yes. Okay. Who else did do we miss? Uh, uh, Naomi and then Fisher. Oh, cool. I, yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting how you're off the page. It's very, very interesting that effect. It is really interesting. It mm -hmm. actually pushes that eye, it pushes that eye back a little bit further. Um, and you can get the same effects like when bang, like if there's like long hair and bangs come over, it almost creates like a I guess like it, it it crops the eye with the hair and it and it feels like the eyes like kind of peeking out and it's it's cool. That's an, as I, I may be unintentional, but it was still a cool effect. <clears throat> um, Fisher, how about you? Uh, oh, there um, it is. Oh, oh, sorry. I'll go first. Okay, I'll go. First, I'm going to show you the feather I did. Yes. Oh. So Nice story you've got going there. Yeah, I do. I like the narrative. I like the narrative oh. and the narrative. Ah. The nice pixel. Yeah, yes. the, the planes of the face are so good. Ooh, hold on a second. Um, yeah, that's great. Do you have, have you ever seen a reticulated head? Like a 3D sculpture of a reticulated head? Maybe. I'm not yeah. sure. Oh. We have one at the studio, and it's a really good way of conceiving about films. Uh, all right, guys, I got to teach this other class in a couple of minutes. Um, does anybody have any questions? I'm showing you mine, Trevor. Oh, because I is there, like it. Yeah. Is there any other? Is there anybody else in Fisher's community? Oh wow, Stacy, replace the pen. I had so much fun with this. Hi, uh, this is up your alley. Get this it? Is your, I, it's your I happy had place. so much fun with this. Oh, Naomi. That's Mr. Really good. Trevor, I want to show you Every, something I drew a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah everybody did a great job. It's probably my hardest drawing that I've done. I drew, um, oh. you know, Venom, the supervillain? I drew him from his name. The V is right there, and then the E, and the N, and the O, and then the M. I drew him out of his Whoa. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I got a pick of that. That's very cool. Um, yeah, it's the the character is terrifying. They've been is it is there a new movie out or something? Is I keep uh, seeing Venom it. Carnage is coming out this year. Yeah, I'm really excited yeah. to watch it. Is it is it coming out for I'm Halloween? Really um, I don't I don't know. It's Venom is its own movie. I don't know if it's like coming out by Halloween time though. Got it. Um, cool. Mr. Twist. Yes, Dace. Thank you so much. This was great. Oh, you're welcome. Um, yeah, I wanted. To, I just wanted to try the eyes. Maybe we'll think about the rest of the face. Um, great work, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Everybody Bye. have a great week. Happy Happy day.